Welcome to episode 260 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up the late sky. And this podcast is for anybody else who likes going out into the stars, except for Mark Ritchie because he had to leave the star party and wasn't able to join us this morning. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe next week. Um, next I, week. I, I totally get it. It's so hard to multitask yeah. at a star party. Or even just like an observing trip, you know, um, you're either observing, sleeping, or probably at a talk, listening to somebody talk about astronomy. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it kind of throws the whole routine out. I think it would have been cool to do it if it, if it had worked out. I think it was a cool idea. And uh, yeah, it, that just, uh, that just sort of happens. But uh, yeah, Mark is a uh, sometimes collaborator of ours and has the refreshing views uh, YouTube channel, and he goes to the star part. They're not called star parties in the UK. There are they? They're called a sky camp. A sky called? camp. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And then he sent me the the URL or the the web link for it, and uh, and I was reading, and and they have a they have very different language. Like um, we call them RVs or or campers. Um, fifth wheels or whatever. That's what we call them here in North America. And over there, they call them caravans, which I know about from having spent a, spent a time going to university over there. And then um, they don't call it like your campsite. It's a pitch. So they were like, and then you don't rent, you hire. So you hire, you hire a caravan and then they set it up on your pitch. So it's like, what's going on here? Is this cricket or is this astronomy? What's happening? Right. So <laughs> Anyway, so he can tell us all about what it's like to hire a caravan and get it set up on a pitch. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to the conversation and hopefully he's getting some good observing in. Yeah, and I'm really hoping, fingers crossed, um, I was talking with uh, Judy. Um, she's a, uh, a sometimes collaborator um, when, when writing and doing the, uh, the odd presentation. And uh, she's over in Alberta and uh, is is doing some uh, research on Lucian Kemble. And she is like a professional researcher. Like that's, that's been her career. And, uh, she's also a darn good observer as well. Like I was telling you, she, um, has observed with a variety of instruments and for a long time, like when I met her, um, at the top of a mountain, <laughs> at the very top of a mountain, um, like a 7,000 foot high mountain, she's got a six inch F8, um, achromatic refractor set up. And so, you know, it just looks, just like you want it to look right. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to go look through that instrument um, when I, where it's when I first met her anyway, let's see. So we have, yeah, some guests coming up. Um, maybe we'll, we'll try to get, get some more folks in and yeah. Did you get any observing in this week, Shane? Not, not nearly enough. That's for sure. Um, just uh, some other things going on that took my focus away, but yeah. I did, um, I did do some solar observing and what's interesting about this, Chris is, um, uh, I, I, well, I got a new solar scope. It's used new to me, but, um, there's been a couple things on the hydrogen alpha front that I've been really interested in. <clears throat> Number one is being able to use my binocular, viewer. And I can't do that with my little Lunt, uh, just because of how the focuser works. Uh, mm -hmm. the Lunt 35, basically like it has a longer nose on the diagonal. So it, that's your course focus. You move the diagonal in and out. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a little helical focuser uh, that is also the eyepiece holder. Um, so because of all of that, you really can't put a bino viewer on there. Oh, okay. um, so what I've been interested in is, is uh, a telescope that would allow that. But I'm also interested in double stacking the etalons. So with hydrogen alpha telescopes, um, there's two major components. There's an, uh, a blocking filter, which is the diagonal. Um, and then there's the etalon, which is the hydrogen alpha filter, essentially. Um, yeah. Now, there's also like a usually an achromatic lens right behind the etalon, um, just like your yep. standard telescope lens. And yeah. basically, that's a H alpha telescope. Oh, wow. um, now, uh, one etalon is how most tele like hydrogen alpha scopes come, and they'll have an angstrom rating, usually around one to maybe 0.7. The lower the angstrom rating, the better the surface detail is that you'll see on the sun. Um, and when you start to double stack your etalons, you lower the angstrom rating, which brings out more surface detail. So 
that was also sort of like a part two to my desire of, uh, or for my, um, uh, need or not really need <laughs> want to upgrade my hydrogen alpha telescope. Mm-hmm. Um, so just a couple weeks ago on astrobicell.com, uh, somebody was selling a Coronado solar max 40 millimeter double stack. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting about this is there's actually two versions of Coronado. There's the Mead Coronado that's being sold today. And then there's the pre Mead. So Coronado used to be its own company. And then I don't know how many years ago, but Mead bought them. I remember and, that. Yeah. yeah and, and some of the manufacturing changed when Mead bought them. And, uh, there's a number of folks online that, you know, seem to gravitate towards the pre Mead Coronado is just due to uh, what they, in their opinion, just a, a, maybe a better quality. So when this double stacked, uh, 40 millimeter solar max pre Mead Coronado popped up, uh, I jumped on it and the, and the cool. price was quite good. Yeah. So I've been doing some, uh, limited, uh, solar observing and, and, uh, what I did actually is I've kind of roughly adapted it to go onto the Borg, uh, 50 millimeter FL, which is actually kind of part three to my <laughs> desire for this upgrade. Uh, I wanted to have removable etalons that I could adapt to my other telescopes so that when I go observing, I really just take one telescope and then a bunch of other sort of attachments, you know, and it's a little more flexible. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the detail is just outstanding. And like, you know, you've heard me talk about my little 35 millimeter Lunt. Like I've often preferred the views through that telescope than like 60 millimeter Lunts and 50 millimeter Lunts that I've looked through. Uh, mm. It's really an outstanding H alpha telescope, but this solar max with the double stack is just like another level of awesomeness. Um, I just cannot get over how prominent like the filaments are um, and all sorts of surface detail. It is just so sharp. Um, and you still maintain like the, the really cool prominence detail. So it's just been phenomenal so far. Um, and what was really neat yesterday when I was doing a little bit of observing in the backyard, uh, is that there was a a very eruptive, um, uh, prominence. It would be, I guess if I do kind of the flipping, it would have been about, if you think of the sun as a clock, it would have been at like seven o'clock ish, um, Mm -hmm. And what was really neat is like, there's often prominences that kind of eject up, but you know, usually the gravity of the sun will pull it back and, you know, you see some very interesting shapes and that's part of the beauty, but this one, it looked like it must've been like quite an ejection because it was quite like, I don't think I've seen anything that far from the solar disc before. And it was huge. Um, but it was kind of easy to miss. It wasn't super bright. And I think like when you're doing H alpha observing, you're really just focusing on the disc of the sun and just right around the edge where the prominences are. Um, but this, uh, this was probably the first time I think I've had a solar observation like that, where there was like a prominence that far away from the sun. It was Mm -hmm. incredible. So, um, I'm excited to do more observing with this new setup. I still haven't tried the Bino Viewer with it, but if you read Bino Viewer and Solar Observing forums, uh, most folks will say like, if you like Bino Viewing at night, try it with H Alpha because that is unbelievable. Apparently, so I'm uh, I'm quite excited for that, and you know, hopefully, I can uh, tease out more detail and just have some really good sessions with that setup. Wow, that sounds really cool. So, what is an Edelon? So the Edelon is like the kind of the front piece of a hydrogen alpha telescope. And that's like the hydrogen alpha filter, essentially, that filters the sun's wavelength to, I forget what it is, um, but in that H alpha band. um, And then the blocking filter that's in the diagonal, that's the one that often takes out a lot of the brightness of the sun. Like that's the safety element of H alpha observing. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So it's been, uh, it's been kind of a neat, uh, a neat little trip and unexpected, you know, it's always been on my list, but you know, when, when it comes to used gear, you, you know, you don't pick the timing of the opportunity. You either do it when it's there or you don't. So I, I decided <laughs> to jump on it. I know, I know. Like I was saying, you know, I wish I had, I, you know, I used to live near a telescope store and the guy had brought in all these, um, six inch f8 acromats and was selling them for like 400 bucks canadian you know years ago and 
you know, I was like, no, I'm good. And he was like willing to do good deals on them, like 325 or 350, maybe 300. And I was like, why didn't I buy one and just stick it under the bed? Right. <laughs> Cause yeah, no you know, <laughs> for, like, not a whole lot of money. It could have had that telescope, but uh, yeah. Anyway. And then, yeah, kind of wish I'd bought that Takahashi eight inch there last uh, two years ago now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. Um, but you know, what do you do? You made the best decision at the time and I'm sure there'll be more details for you yeah, yeah. in the future. So yeah. Yeah. You know. Hopefully. How about you? I know you did some crazy observing last night and just in general, what have you been up to? Yeah. Uh, back teaching my astronomy class in person. So this okay. was my first astronomy class in person since the pandemic. So they had asked if I wanted to do one in person in the spring um, but I hadn't really chatted with the students about it. And sometimes I get, um, some of the same students. And then sometimes I get, uh, you know, well, it's sort of a mix of people who've taken it before and then, um, people who, uh, who, who are brand new. Um, and so when I asked them, I was really surprised, uh, to find out that it was sort of a mixed bag of people that want it in person and people that want it online and people that would still come out. And, that's kind of the way that it went. So I kind of anticipated that, oh, we'll get like people showing up and nobody wear a mask and, you know, cause they're comfortable, but it wasn't, it was like a mixed bag of, of people that were very comfortable sort of being out and people that maybe weren't, weren't as, um, but, uh, you know, we continue on and, uh, yeah, I kind of just sort of wore my mask when I was, uh, you know, in close with people because we were able to set up and, uh, and do the do the whole telescope thing and uh, that was pretty exciting yeah to be able to actually start showing uh stuff to people through uh through the telescope was super exciting uh you know especially when people hadn't even seen anything through a telescope before oh that's awesome yeah um it's you know it's great that we're able to start doing that stuff again i you know i've certainly missed the a bit of that outreach and connecting with people in person you know it's just uh it's just nice yeah yeah. So yeah. So I'm doing four weeks in person, then four weeks online, and then gonna evaluate and see uh, see how it goes. There's sort of advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, yeah. So one of the advantages is that uh, in person, of course, you know, and it was it was great. Like so, the Wednesday night we had uh, clear skies. I was able to go out and set up, and uh, yeah, we did like about an hour and a bit of lecture. And then, uh, yeah, had people out looking at uh, Saturn and Jupiter, but I forgot my one and a quarter inch adapter. So <laughs> it so, was low power views all around. <laughs> ah, I see. I see. So you, you couldn't really put the power on Jupiter to see some of the, the banding detail. No, no. I kind of want to show people uh, Saturn's rings as well. And people could kind of sort of see a bit of a spike, but uh, yeah, no, I got to make sure I drag an adapter back with me. Um, and I have spare adapters too. I just thought I had one in the, in the bag that I grabbed, but, uh, I did not of course. And so then, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it was still worth it because people, um, many of the people had never looked through a telescope before. So mm -hmm. then it's just like good practice for looking through when you just have it at low power and it's a very forgiving eyepiece and, and whatever, then we can, uh, when we get the higher power eyepiece this week, hopefully, um, then we uh, will already have people that have looked through a telescope before. So they're more comfortable. We're able to do stuff like kind of point out, you know, the big dipper pattern of stars and how to use that to find the North star and the little dipper. And I showed the Mark Taurus through the telescope too, and what that looked like. So yeah, we're able to, to do a, do a few things like that. So yeah, that was kind of fun. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. And then Friday night, was kind of sort of clear because we had the like a huge rainstorm there on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And so I drove out uh, to the dark site here and then uh, it, it did rain sort of off and on through the night, even drizzled uh, off and on Friday. It was really, it was supposed to be clear and sunny, but it wasn't, it was sort of just a dull, miserable day. <laughs> so nothing dried out, but then at night it actually uh, cleared up for about, the better part of an hour and I just did a, uh, like a binocular session mm -hmm. and then, uh, yeah, I cleared out in the morning as well. And I got up. So I did, I did maybe not quite an hour, maybe like 40 minutes 
on Friday evening. And then I get up and did about half an hour on Saturday morning. But uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of fun just to get out with the binoculars and took a look at the summer beehive and um, NGC 6633, which is a nearby cluster and looked at the Scutum star cloud and took a scan down the summer Milky Way and decided I'd take a look at some galaxies like M31 and M33 and 81 and 82. And then I'd like to take a pan across that northern uh, winter Milky or not really winter Milky Way, but sort of northern uh, Milky Way that starts rising at, at autumn and uh, took a look at Kemble's Cascade and has Minos cluster and was panning through Perseus and, and stumbled upon this. I, sh- I you and I looked at this galaxy along or not galaxy open cluster a long time ago, which was uh, NGC 1528, which is uh, a great cluster and, and easy to see in binoculars and resolved well at, uh, at low power in small, uh, in my small scope. So, um, but yeah, uh, beautiful cluster there. NGC 1528. If people are looking for something, it's just uh 6.4 magnitude, so it's fairly bright and uh, just about half a degree in size. It's it's pretty large, so it really pops in the binoculars like you're just sweeping around up there. And then uh, then I put the telescope on it last night and uh, had a decent uh, decent view of it. But I remember the first time I looked at that open cluster, you and I were uh, were out in a field way outside of Moose Jaw, and there was all these coyotes around. And that's what I was looking at that night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the memories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then last night I went and tried to look at this comet. The comet, I think it's E3, has a big long funny name to it, but I'm just calling it Comet E3. And uh I spent like an hour trying to track it down. And I I think I saw it as kind of stellar-ish, but that uh, comet catcher is out of alignment. And uh so it was hard to tell if if uh, if the star that I was looking at was the comet or not, but I, I think it was because there's no star in that spot, and it was it was in the in the location it should be. But what what made it difficult to ID the field was that I had this extra star there, right? <laughs> then mm-hmm. what's in the what's on the star charts or in my software? So sort of one of those things when you're looking at when you're looking for deep sky objects. Um, this doesn't happen as much because like in the charts and whatever, it's properly framed. But when you're looking at your star chart in the field, it doesn't have the comet plotted in. And then you're like trying to sort of, so I was kind of running in and going back and forth to, to the computer a bit. And, and then, and then heading back out, <laughs> walking up the hill to that point of dark adapted again and trying to hunt it down. But yeah, I spent like, oh man, at least an hour. And it was super windy too. Like, I think you were even commenting how windy it was yesterday. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I was considering setting up last night, but we, we had quite a bit of wind. It started to dissipate and I think probably around 11 PM, it might not mm. have been too bad, but, um, it's still like, I think it still would have been small telescope time because anything large would have just been, uh, catching the wind too much. Yeah, it was, it, the telescope was okay, but when the, it, and it was fine at first because it was fairly warm. It was like when I started observing, it was still 16 degrees Celsius. So I just had a sweater on and then I put a vest on, then I put a hat on, then I put my winter coat. Like every time I came in, I was putting like an extra layer on. And then the last time I went out, it was, I think it had dropped to nine degrees or something like that. And this is just over the course of, over the course of, uh, you know, two and a half hours or so. And I was like, oh yeah, this is, it's just getting too cold. And the telescope was so cold to the touch. Like my fingers are still cold today kind of thing. Um, so I was not really successful in hunting down the comet. I think if I had my refractor set up, I probably would have been able to use enough power to, to sort out something that was non-stellar. But I, I think I did get the, get the comet because it was a star in the right spot. But it's, it's fairly faint. It says 12th magnitude, but then I saw some reports that were like 10th magnitude or so. And I think it's supposed to get fairly bright, maybe as bright as fifth magnitude in the, in the winter time. So sort of one to, to keep track of. It's not uh, something that, uh, that, that is brightening uh, or at its peak right now. It's, it's going to continue to brighten over the coming months. So something to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. The, 
the forecast for this comet is quite exciting. Like I think by January timeframe, it could be like magnitude five, maybe even four. Mm -hmm. Um, But as we've stated many times, these things are highly unpredictable and very erratic. So you, you just don't know. So all you can do is observe it uh, as it brightens and then keep your fingers crossed that it continues to brighten and and reach or exceed some of these uh, estimates. Yeah. And I don't know whether it had a small outburst and it's just settled down again because I was looking at photos online and the photos online were showing this nice little tail coming off it, but I, I definitely didn't, didn't see that. I don't think like, again, if, if that telescope was properly aligned, I gotta, I gotta arm wrestle you into maybe even him because <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a Rube Goldberg kind of kind of device, but I do, I do really like the comet catcher. It's, it's a fun scope. It really is a really cool scope. I like it a lot. So yeah. I think yeah. It's, 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 it's a neat little telescope. But, uh, and if we can get it aligned, I think it'll be a really, a really good performer too. Oh yeah. Yeah. I just need to, uh, just need to kind of get some tools and then pop it apart and then yeah, do some alignment there. Um, so I tore, actually, I took a look after I, I spent, oh, probably Oh, it must have been more than an hour because I was out for almost three hours. And then uh, I looked at M5, um, Messier 5, which is a globular cl- cluster in Serpent's Kaput. And then uh, took a, a nice look at uh, NGC 1528, that open cluster there in uh, Perseus. But by that time, I was getting pretty cold. So, and there, it kind of like the wind kind of picked up again around 10 or so. Mm-hmm. So I was like, ah, gee. And then I was like, well, I don't want to stop observing. So I actually tore down and then I reset back up on my deck, which sort of was blocked. Uh, the, the the place was blocking the, the wind from that spot. So I set up there and decided, well, I wanted to look at the Helix Nebula because actually I never looked at it from out here before and, and wanted to take a, take a peek. So kind of scan around with the binoculars and I thought, I, ooh, I think I kind of got it in the binoculars. So, you know, verified that in the chart and then, yeah, put uh, put the twenty two Nagler back in the uh, comet catcher, and oh, I think that's a brightening there, right beside those those two stars, and then put the uh, nebula filter in. And man, it was it was sort of a weird view because usually I think of it as being really quite round. And then uh, last night I was really picking up maybe some of those other shells in that because it definitely it did not look round to my eye, but I was having trouble kind of getting the sort of out of round shape down. So I didn't sketch it or anything, but uh, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely was out of round. I could see like some of the stars in it and everything with the O3 still. So yeah, it was uh, yeah pretty cool. Yeah. You've, you've probably looked at the, the helix quite a few times. It's pretty popular. I think it's like the biggest and brightest planetary we can see from, from here. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great object to check out. Um, you know, it, it shows in just about, well, most, most apertures, you know, you can pull it out and it's a, it's a fun object. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then I got up this morning, set the alarm and actually woke up about an hour before the alarm. And I was like, you know, I should have gotten up at this time. So I'm going to get up at this time. So, so I get up and, uh, and went back out at about three or just before and uh and did another couple hours stayed out till five or or just before because i wanted to uh, see if i could hunt down the uh cocoon nebula ic uh, 5146 which is up on the lacertus uh cygnus border and i i hadn't hunted that one down in years and i wanted to do a bit of a sketch of it so um when you go to hunt that down you find uh messy 39 and then you pan up into the left or to the northeast, and you find this big, dark nebula called uh, Barnard 168. And uh, it's a really unmistakable uh, dark nebula. And then uh, what you do from there is you follow that nebula along, and at the end of it is where the cocoon is. But if you only go another, maybe another two degrees or something like that, you get to NGC 7209, which is an open cluster. And that kind of masquerades as the, uh, as the cocoon nebula. And so I remember looking at pictures of the cocoon nebula, which is um, this uh, stellar nursery where there's still some star forming uh, action going on there. But 
I remember when I when I first had Terrence Dickinson's backyard astronomers guide. Do you remember that? He had he actually had a picture of it and was and was talking about like how to go about observing it. I, I never forget that. Do you? It, oh, that it, that doesn't stand out for me. No, well, it, for some reason it did for me because I thought this is really cool. There's this dark yeah. nebula and there's this um, bright nebula at the end of it, which is a star forming region. And I always thought, oh, that's that's really really a neat thing, and that you can see the um, the dark nebula really well in binoculars. It doesn't show as well in the telescope, and then the telescope you can see the uh, uh, this this nebula at the end of the dark lane. But anyway, yeah. So kind of did this big scan up and down, and you know, at first I was like. You know, I kind of get tricked into the 7209 open cluster, but then what you do is you really need a, an H beta filter to thread on, and then uh, you thread that on. You see that oh, that cluster is really just a fainter cluster, and um, you got to sort of backtrack and then find out where there's like this hub at the end of the uh, the Barnard 1, 160 dark lane, and and then start piecing apart the stars in there to kind of whittle down where where this, uh, this little nebula is, but, uh, I think you said maybe you'd seen it in, in your 12 inch. Yeah. I'd have to check my observing logs, but I'm, I'm sure I did many years ago. Um, although I don't remember if that was like one of our little sort of on the back of a country road <laughs> observing sessions, or if it was at, uh, one of the dedicated observing sites around here, I, I don't recall. Yeah. It, it's a bit of a challenging one, like, especially in, in like a five inch class mm-hmm. instrument if i feel like a 12 inch would probably uh, show it reasonably reasonably well but uh yeah hopefully uh one day when i get a bigger scope be able to piece it apart a little bit more but i was able to see the nebula um once i put the filter without the filter no nebula with the filter nebula so uh yeah i was able to kind of piece that out maybe see some parts of the uh the dark lane channeling uh in and around there there's also like a colander cluster that is sort of wrapped in and around and I could see some of the stars inside the the nebula with averted vision kind of and I spent I think I spent once I once I tracked it down I spent at least an hour on it so I spent a long time just observing it could kind of see the there's like two brighter stars in it you can see maybe three or four other stars in it kind of sort of twinkling uh in and out was uh yeah a really nice view I hadn't I don't think I'd seen it as well the first time but uh yeah, I would like to get that that telescope uh, more aligned. I think one of the things with that scope is is that the uh, what do you call them the the bolts, the alignment bolts. I think are slacked off too much, so it just depends on where I'm looking in the sky. And sometimes, like I was looking at that, I had really sharp images, and then I switched over and then went over to like the Orion Nebula and couldn't get sharp images, <laughs> like because. That the mirror flopped over to the other side. Oh kind of uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I did take a look at at the Orion Nebula and uh, kind of panned around. I tr- I started trying to hunt down the Horsehead Nebula, but I was like, oh, it was like by this time it was you know basically five o'clock in the morning, and I already put in about five hours observing over the over the past night anyway i wasn't sure when it was starting to get light i was like it's gonna take me an hour to get this too and i'm i'm spent and i think it's gonna start getting bright i'm just gonna start working against myself here so uh i took i took a quick look at barnard's loop and then yeah then i just uh just packed it in so yeah but it was yeah it was kind of fun fun to go out and yeah that's really guy is really really high now so i really forgot Cool. You still with me? Yeah, yeah. You everything were, you, just went you, were, you were breaking up there. I wasn't sure if you're still there or not. So yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, maybe with that, we'll uh, yeah, maybe we'll toss it back to uh, to you for some solar observing uh, email from Peter. I think uh, he'd written us a note there. Yeah. Um, so Peter said, "Hey, Chris and Shane, uh, we finally had a few days of clear days." Uh, and nights here. So I've been very active with the scopes. Uh, I got started with solar observing and imaging. Uh, I've been focusing on white light with my AT60ED scope and a Lunt two inch Herschel wedge. Um, he, as, as of the writing of this email, he said he's waiting for his Lunt 50 millimeter H alpha, but uh, he also sent us another email uh, that the H alpha has arrived, but I don't think he had a great chance to use it yet. Um, anyway, back to this email. 
Uh, Peter says, I'm, I put in a two inch polarizing filter, which uh, seems to help with exposing the surface features. Um, and I can certainly attest to that. Like uh, even like white light, uh, solar observing, or even hydrogen alpha, sometimes I do like to add a polarizing filter um, because even, even with all of these, you know, H alpha and white light, even though it takes uh, so much of the light away, sometimes I find the view still too bright. And when you uh, control that a bit better. It brings out some of the finer detail. Uh, it was uh, such a great or such a treat to get my first views of the sun. Uh, I've been using a Bader 8x24 zoom for this to minimize the amount of fiddling I have to do while I'm learning. Uh, I've also done some imaging. Uh, so far, I've used a high resolution guide camera, which allows me to image the full disk. This is done by the standard planetary method of shooting video and stacking the best frames. Uh, this camera only has a slow frame rate, so I expect to do better once I get uh, the camera with both high resolution and frame rate. Uh, but the image turned out well enough to share. Uh, notice it captures some surface uh, texture as well as the sunspots. I didn't see the texture through the eyepiece. So there's, there's a ton of granulation in this image as well as some faculae. Uh, near the sunspots and uh, near the, uh, I'm going to guess here, the eastern limb? Or is that the what? No, that would be the western limb because we've got to gotta flip that. Okay. Uh, uh, what else here? He says, uh, by the way, I'm using an AZ G AZ GTI mount for this. I'm using it the way Chris does with just the tracking. I'm not entirely happy with this because even with the tracking on the image, uh, it does tend to drift not or appreciably. Uh, maybe mm. I'm doing something wrong. Uh, welcome. Any thoughts you have, Chris, any yeah. thoughts there? Yeah. So the main that I have is to make sure it's level. If it's, if it's not level, then yeah, that's how, that's how it rolls. It has to be, has to be level. Yeah. So yeah. Which is like most tracking mounts really. You, yeah. You need to I feel start like it there. should be though. Cause I don't know if he's using it on a tripod. Cause I think he has like a, a permanent or semi-permanent pier or something like that in his yard, but maybe he's just putting it on like one of the other tripods and then, and then just setting it out. Maybe he's not putting it on that pier. And that's what I was doing at first. And I had the same experience that Peter has. And then I, I started doing that, but uh, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's one of those things. If you have to make sure you have it aligned and then point it, I think it has to be pointed North or something like that. Once you kind of do that, then, like I just turn it on and set that um, sidereal tracking and that's, that's all I use or use the point track or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's good enough. Like at 150 power, it will still stay in the field of view for, I don't know, like a minute or two. And that's all I need. You know, I can, I don't mind if I have to nudge the scope a bit or, or whatever. Um, and then if I'm doing a sketch of a deep sky or something, typically that's so low power anyway, it doesn't matter. In fact, like last night, I didn't even bother powering up the mount. I just, uh, just used it in uh, no power mode skin around. So yeah, it, it depends, but I think he's trying to do photos with it. So that's, that definitely is going to be a lot, uh, a lot pickier than, uh, than that. So you have to go through that, like the proper alignment process and, and all that stuff. So, but there's lots of good help resources on cloudy nights. I know I've used them quite a bit. So yeah, just head over to the mount section there on cloudy nights.com and, uh, you should be able to find the answer for what you're looking for. There's people on there that have like pulled it apart and completely rebuilt it and turned it in equatorial mountains, stuff like that. Pretty, pretty wild stuff. So should mm -hmm. be able to sort it out. Yeah. Right on. Um, so then Peter switches to evening observing, uh, or nighttime. So Friday night, I had a banner session of visual observing with the TAC FC 100 DZ. Uh, I started by looking at Saturn and Jupiter. I was using uh, a go-to with the AVX mount based on rough polar alignment. Uh, I started by using the Bader zoom 24 millimeters for framing, then zoom to eight. Uh, at that point, I swapped in the Pentax uh, XW 3.5 millimeter. Uh, for Saturn, the view was like a small photograph. Very impressive. Uh, I had more trouble with Jupiter, which was lower in the sky where the seeing was poorer but the view is still excellent. Mm. Uh, next I moved to M31, which appeared as an, uh, ellipsoidal, uh, cloud with a brighter center, uh, visuals on galaxies and nebula here are not spectacular because of light pollution. Uh, one does much better with imaging. 
uh, serendipitously, I was using my iPhone to look for targets and somehow Kemble's Cascade and NGC 1502 showed up. So I had a look at those for the first time. Uh, NGC 1502 is really nice and I plan to work on imaging it soon. Uh, then I noticed that the moon had come up in the east uh, and to get uh, and and to the right of it, Mars. Uh, so I got or so I got my first ever observation of Mars. It was low in the sky, but I could clearly see two shades of color in the gibbous phase. Uh, I'm also working on imaging planets with both the C8 and the TAC. Uh, for me, the hardest thing about this is getting the target into the frame at very high magnification and keeping it there. Uh, here are two images, the first one taken with the TAC uh, and the ASI462MC camera on Saturday night. Wanted to add the TV uh, Teleview power mate uh, five times, but uh, this, or sorry, for this, but I had not prepped uh, and I couldn't get, or I couldn't frame the target. Um, so anyway, attached a couple photos of Saturn as well, which are, are quite good. And, you yeah. know, what I like about these photos, Chris, um, I don't know what you think, but they, they really remind me of like what Saturn looks like visually through the telescope. Um, mm -hmm. and I always appreciate images that represent the visual observation just because, most images are are outstanding, you know, in terms of like the acquisition time and all of the post processing, and they look mm -hmm. great. But I just, you know, I have an affinity for you know the the visual side, and and certainly yep. appreciate photos that represent that. Yeah, no, really, really nice to get those from uh, from Peter. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the email. Really good. Okay, anything else, Shane? Anything you want to add to the episode? No, that's it, Chris. All right. Well, thanks, Shane. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Be sure to subscribe in your podcasting software, and you can always reach us at actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>